This is the second video lecture for section 2.6 on impossibility and alternative balance. In this lecture, I'll be talking about approval and range voting. In the previous lecture, we talked about four different types of ballots, two of which are fairly familiar to us and two of which are new. So we've hopefully seen this idea of a single ballot. That's the kind of ballot that we use in most of our elections in the real world. The rank ballot, ranking the candidates in some preference order, that's the kind of ballot that we would need to use many of the different methods that we've talked about. But now we've got two new kinds of ballots, an approval ballot, where we put a mark next to any candidate that we approve of, so we can vote for more than one candidate, and then a range ballot, where we rate each candidate on some scale. In this example, I'm showing you a scale from one to five, but it really can be anything. And this allows us to also rate candidates in a tied manner. So how do we use an approval ballot to determine the winner of an election? So all we do is we add up the number of votes that each candidate got and the candidate with the most votes wins. So the description of the voter profile has to be a little bit more complicated looking, but the way that we read this is if we look at the first row of this table, this means that we had six ballots that put a mark next to candidate E and a mark next to candidate F and didn't put a mark next to candidate G or a mark next to candidate H. So we had six ballots that look like that, five ballots that look like just a mark next to F, five ballots that look like just a mark next to G, and so on. So now if we want to add up the number of votes that each candidate got, we just add up the number of X's that they received. So if we want to add up the number of points that candidate E received, well, they had six ballots, and then four more ballots, and then one ballot here at the end, we add up those numbers and we get 11. Similarly, if we want to add up the number of votes that candidate F got, they got six ballots from that first X, five ballots with that second X, and four ballots with that third X, so 15. So we're using these numbers and we're adding up the numbers wherever there was an X in that column. So G only gets five votes and H gets four plus two, which is six. And then of all of these totals, we find the one that has the largest total. In this case, that's candidate F. So we say that F wins. So that's how we find the winner of an approval election. So one of the things that we can think about when we think about approval ballots is that the voter really does still have some kind of preference order. But what they're thinking of their preference order, and they're saying, well, for the candidates that are ranked high enough for me my, as a particular voter, then I'm going to put an X next to those candidates' names. And the candidates who are not ranked high enough, I'm going to not put an X next to their names. So for example, let's say we had a voter that had preference order B first, D second, A third, and C last. Well, there's a bunch of different ways that this voter could maintain that preference order and cast their ballot. So for example, if this voter, had, this voter has B ranked first, and then D second, A third, C fourth, one way that they could cast their ballot is to draw the cutoff here. They could say, well, B and D, they're ranked high enough for me to be willing to put an X next to their name. A and C are not. So in this person's ballot, the ballot might look something like, you know, if they say vote, and then there's a box next to A, a box next to B, a box next to C, and a box next to D, this voter would put a check in the mark for B, uh, check in the box next to D, but they would not put a check next to the box for A or C. But of course, that's not the only way that this voter could write their cutoff. There's a lot of different ways. So for example, the voter could say, no, only B is good enough. I'm going to draw the line there. Or the voter could say, you know what, I'm feeling generous. I'm going to draw the line way down here and approve of B, D, and A. And even the voter could say, you know what, all of these candidates are good enough. I'm going to approve of all of them. I'm going to put the cutoff all the way at the bottom and put a mark next to all of the candidates. Or the voter could be extremely picky and say, you know what, none of these candidates work, so I'm going to put the line all the way at the top and not put a mark next to any of those candidates. Now these last two ballots are basically just the same as not voting. Because if we don't put a mark next to any candidate, then no candidate benefits from our ballot, so it's as if we didn't vote at all. And if we put a mark next to all of the candidates, then everyone's total is increased by one from our ballot, and that's not going to help any candidate win versus any other candidate. So really, we don't really think about these last two preferences all that much, but they could happen. Okay, so here's an example. 
where we have a full voter profile with preferences, but we also have cutoffs listed. So this is going to allow us to not only figure out who the approval winner is, but also use one of our other methods, specifically the Congress A method. So let's start with the approval winner. Okay, so how do we read this kind of voter profile? So this right here tells us that we have four voters who like A first, B second, and C third, and put their cutoff so that they're gonna approve of A and B and not approve of C. So that's gonna give A four votes and B four votes and C no votes so far from that first row of my table. In this row of my table, these voters like B the best and then we, the, we get to the cutoff. So that means that's gonna be three votes for B, but no additional votes for A or C. And then these voters here, they like C the best and then they draw their cutoff. So that's gonna be two votes for C, but no additional votes for A or B. So if I add up these numbers, I see that A gets four votes, B gets seven, C gets two, seven is the most, so B is the winner. But because we have our full voter profile, we have the full preferences, we can also figure out the Condorcet winner. We can also figure out who wins A versus B, we can figure out who wins A versus C, and we can figure out who wins B versus C. So A versus B, the four voters at the top, they vote for A, three voters in the second row vote for B, and the two voters in the third row, they vote for A, so A will win that election six to three. A versus C, the four voters at the top vote for A, the three voters in the next row also vote for A, and the two voters at the bottom vote for C. So A is going to beat C seven to two, and B versus C, B gets four votes, B gets three more votes, and then C gets the two votes at the bottom. So B is gonna win that election. But what we see is that A is the Condorcet winner. because A beat both of their opponents. So what we were seeing here is that even though approval voting seems kind of nice, we can vote for multiple candidates, it does not satisfy the Condorcet winner criterion because there was a Condorcet winner, but our method approval voting did not find that person or that candidate as the winner. Here's another example that shows an even maybe a deeper problem. So again, we have a voter preference, voter profile here with cutoffs, we can figure out the approval winner and we can also figure out, in this case, we're gonna find the plurality winner. Okay, so start with approval. These six voters, they drew their preference all the way at the bottom, which means they're gonna put a, par a mark on their ballot next to all three candidates, A, B, and C. So A gets six votes, B gets six votes, and C gets six votes. Second row of our table, our cutoff is after B and C, so B and C are gonna get these three votes and A will not. And then in this third row of my table, only C is gonna get those votes, A and B will not. So no votes for A and B there. So A gets six total, B gets nine total, C is gonna get 11 total, C is the plurality winner. Sorry, C is the approval winner. Now we're gonna figure out the plurality winner. So for plurality, remember, we only care about first place votes. So we can only pay attention to this part of our voter profile. We don't pay attention to any of the rest of that. So A is gonna get six votes, B is gonna get three votes, C is only gonna get two votes, so A wins. A is the plurality winner. Now, normally we don't typically compare the plurality winner with the winner using another method, but in this case, I think it illustrates one potential problem with approval voting, which is not only did A win a plurality, A actually got a majority. If we add up the total number of voters here, we have six plus three plus two is 11 voters. A majority, remember, is more than half is more than 11 divided by two, which is 5.5. And A got more than 5.5, A got six votes. So not only was A the plurality winner, A got a majority of the first place votes, and yet C was our approval voting winner, and C was dead last in the first place votes. Very few people in this election liked C the best. So is this a problem? It doesn't match up with any of our uh, fairness criteria, but it does sort of illustrate that the approval winner can be vastly different than the winner using our other methods. Okay, now let's talk about range voting. Remember that with a range ballot, what we do is we put a rating next to each candidate. In this case, I've shown you example with the scale being from one to five, but it could be a scale from one to 10. There's a lot of different ways that we can do that. And then what we do is we add up the points for each candidate and the candidate with the most points wins. So again, we have sort of a fairly complicated looking voter profile, but again, how do we read this? So we've got eight ballots and on those eight ballots, the person put a five next to candidate E, put a four next to candidate F, 
put a 3 next to candidate G and a 1 next to candidate H. So how many points did each candidate get? We start adding this up. From those eight ballots, that's eight ballots where E got a five. So that's eight times five, which is 40 points for E. And F had eight ballots that each rated F as a four. So that's eight times four, which is 32. So if you don't have a calculator handy, it might be helpful to follow along here. G, there were eight ballots that had a three next to G. So that's eight times three, which is 24 and h, 8 times 1 is 8. And then we keep going. So now we have five ballots. So in those five ballots, that person put a 3 next to candidate E. So that's 5 times 3, which is 15 points. F is going to get five ballots with a 5 each of them. So that's going to be 25 points. G, there were five ballots with a 2. So 5 times 2 is 10, and so on. So we're going to keep going like this. Five ballots with a 2 for h, so another 10 points for h. All right, I'm going to stop writing out the multiplication, but I'm just going to keep putting the numbers. So again, we have five ballots, five ballots with a one next to E. So that's five times one, which is five. F, again, five ballots with one point on them each. So that's five times one, which is five. For candidate G, five ballots with a five on each of them for G. So five times five, which is 25 more points for G. And then H, five times one is five. Keep going. For E, four times four is 16. 4 times 3 is 12 for F, for G, 4 times 2 is 8, and for H, 4 times 5 is 20. And then finally, one ballot at the bottom, 1 times 5 is 5, 1 times 3, 1 times 3, 1 times 3. Okay, so E's total is going to be 40 plus 15 plus 5 plus 16 plus 5. F's total is going to be 32 plus 25 plus 5 plus 12, plus 3. G's total is going to be 24, plus 10, plus 25, plus 8, plus 3. And H's total is going to be 8, plus 10, plus 5, plus 20, plus 3. All right, so I'm going to grab my calculator and add all those up. And there's my totals. So E gets 81 points total, F gets 77, G gets 70, and H gets 46. So we look at the totals and we say, which one of those totals is the highest? In this case, E has the highest total, so E is the winner. So a little bit more work than approval voting, but again, you just multiply the number of ballots times the number of points that that candidate got on those ballots. Now, when we think about it, range voting is really a generalization of approval voting. Approval voting can be thought of as a special kind of range voting. In approval voting, you either vote for a candidate or you don't. So you can think of that as a scale of either zero or one. So on your ballot, you either give a candidate a score of zero if you didn't vote for them, or you give them a one if you did vote for them. And then instead of multiplying, we're really just always multiplying either by zero, in which case we don't add to the total, or we multiply by one, in which case we just add that number of ballots to the total. And so that's really exactly approval voting if we think of range voting with a scale of zero or one. So general range voting lets you have sort of shades of gray. You can say, well, instead of just zero to one, what about a scale from zero to 10 or a scale from one to 100 or something like that? So it lets you get a little bit more detailed, but approval voting is just a specific kind of range voting. So because we've seen that approval voting has problems, and approval voting is just a special kind of range voting, well, then range voting has those problems too. We can cook up examples that illustrate some of the weird situations that we saw with approval voting. We can do the same thing with range voting. So it looks like we didn't really solve the problem that was indicated by Arrow's theorem. If you remember, Arrow's theorem said that we can't have all five of these properties. We can't have a, a voting system that always gives a winner, is not a dictatorship, doesn't have spoilers, satisfies the Pareto condition, and then also voters ranking their candidates in order. Now we've already given this up. If we're using approval voting or range voting, we've already said, okay, we're not gonna have our candidates being ranked, but these approval and range votings can have these properties, right? So we can have always having a winner, except for ties, no dictatorship, no spoilers, satisfying the Pareto condition, we get all that stuff. So it is a, an improvement. So there is something to be said for approval voting or range voting. So we've considered a large number of different voting methods at this point, and we've seen that none of these methods is really perfectly fair. They all have some kind of flaws. 
But a lot of these alternative methods do have advantages over our common plurality system. Specifically, they allow us to express our preferences and have an influence on the final result, even if we're not casting our first place ballot for one of the major party candidates. And in fact, in the US, the state of Maine has actually started using instant runoff voting for the 2020 elections. So there is progress being made in the country on this 